Dr. David Chester recently created an in-depth overview of theories more complicated than general relativity. And today he will be discussing those with a focus on gravity and possible applications for gravity modification and engineering. David's career as a physicist includes work on efficient scattering amplitude methods for Yang Mills theory. His PhD thesis discussed how to compute uh, gravitational radiation from Feynman diagrams. And he's had a long-term interest in the application of exceptional mathematics to describe quantum gravity beyond standard model physics. Um, David Chester has spoken at APEC before. I mean, he is one of the, the big guns in terms of gravity. And so uh, I, I'm absolutely pleased to have him here. Um, David, uh, let me see. Let me, let me ask you to unmute, sir. Hello, everyone. <laughs> and thank you for joining us. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Awesome, so I'll try to share my screen and hopefully I'm in. Awesome, so let me get rid of this. Today I'm going to talk about, I first titled this the most general theory of relativity, but then I realized it's really about the most general theories of relativity. Um, I will try to talk uh, about metric engineering a little bit. I mostly took these slides from another talk and tried to repurpose them. So apologies if it's talk is pretty technical, but uh, I did the best I can. So uh, we're gonna talk about subsectors of this larger uh, framework called metric affine gravity. And basically every theory of gravity I've ever seen uh, fits within this, this framework. So that's why it's interesting to me. And so there's gonna be a lot of technical things going on. So. Um, if you're going to get anything out of this talk, I would just say that the main point is that when you refer to gravity, usually people, at least in Einstein's theory, um, you think of it as curvature, but there, there's differential geometry and there's three notions of differential geometry called curvature, torsion, and nonmetricity. And all three of these geometries are types, uh, forms of gravity. So um, maybe you've heard a little bit about torsion, maybe you haven't heard of nonmetricity before. So if I would just take away anything from this talk, it would be that gravity is really all three of these things in principle, and general relativity only has curvature. So, um, and then basically there's many different theories that you can study with different geometry. Some of them are equivalent to GR, and some of them have better properties such as uh, global conservation laws or uh, quantum behavior. So uh, the motivation for, for this group here is obviously um, we're interested in alternative propulsion, and I'll briefly talk about the Alcubier drive a little bit in um, another paper that briefly mentioned prospects for warp drive in the context of these uh, complicated theories. And just uh, as a legal disclaimer, um, this talk will have a lot of mathematics, so I apologize for the technical details. I, I, you know, if I had more time, I would have tried to simplify a lot of these things for this audience, but um, I, I gave this talk elsewhere and then just repurposed a lot of things. So. Um, yeah, the, once again, the main message is gravity is more than just curvature. And so basically what has been realized fairly recently in the past uh, three years is that there's this uh, quote unquote geometrical trinity of gravity. And uh, basically you can have curvature, uh, torsion and non-metricity. And it turns out there are three different theories that have these different geometries. So general relativity has curvature, but it has no torsion and no non-metricity. And obviously the first thing to think is, well, if I use a different geometry, then I would obviously get a different theory, right? Well, it turns out that you can get these different theories that have different geometry yet have the same vacuum dynamics. So metric teleparallelism is one example. This theory has torsion, but it has no non-metricity and it has no curvature. And there's also uh, this symmetric teleparallelism that has non-metricity. So it's often said that uh, teleparallelism was kind of Einstein's failed theory of gravity, but in present day, there are now two formulations of teleparallelism that are equivalent to GR, uh, which is quite interesting. So metric affine gravity basically is combining curvature, torsion, and non-metricity. And uh, as such, it can contain all three of these equivalents. So if we had this triangle uh, before, you can think about it as uh, the triangle as being inside a cube where uh, at the corner of the cube, you could have all three. So um, this was something I was working on about 2018. I was constructing this cube of gravity and then um, I was mapping all these different theories. So if you had no curvature, no torsion and no non-metricity, at least 
in this uh, cube of let's call them Einsteinian theories of gravity, you can imagine like there's no gravitation. So that's just special relativity. And that would be at one corner of the cube. And then the cube is in three dimensions. And this isn't space or anything. This is just an abstract space of theories. So you can have an axis with curvature, an axis for torsion, and an axis for non metricity And uh, basically, since general relativity only has curvature, you could put that um, at a vertex at one corner of the cube, let's say one comma zero comma zero, and the zeros represent uh, no torsion, no non-metricity. And then so you can see that that trinity of gravity is basically a triangle uh, corresponding to the different axes of this cube. So uh, the metric teleparallel theory has torsion and the symmetric teleparallel theory has non-metricity. There's also been this general teleparallel theory that combines both of those that's been discussed. Um, it's also common to discuss, um, actually the, the more common one is the Einstein-Carton geometry and the Poincaré gauge gravity that involves curvature and torsion. That's pretty common, um, commonly studied. There's also this uh, riemann weyl geometry that combines uh, Riemannian curvature with non-metricity, which was initially introduced by Weyl. And then metric affine gravity is kind of at the other end of special relativity where it has all three. And so um, basically these are theories, but technically I'm referring to the geometries themselves. Um, but then obviously theories exhibit a uh, certain, certain geometry. So the, the scope of all possible theories is actually much more complicated than this. This is just a, like a first, first approximation for uh, diving into it. So uh, this cube kind of brings that Trinity together and, and shows a, um, more complicated theories as well. So I'll just briefly go through uh, what curvature and torsion is since uh, there's a nice geometric picture. So typically um, general relativity, you're, 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 you're worrying about transport of objects on some curved manifold. So it becomes difficult to think about how to move vectors around. So if you had different fields, maybe it's a vector field like an electromagnetic field, that's some vector field. And you can imagine maybe you have some electron that's emitting some radiation and then the electron is you know, moving around on some curved space time and you wanna figure out how you can transport everything properly. And so one thing that's commonly done is to look at um, transporting in loops. And so the idea is when you go in a loop, you kind of come back to where you started. So if something, if you kind of go in a loop and something changes, then that, that you know, you came back to where you started so that that change um, is something non-trivial. So another way to go around a loop is just to think about first starting at P you could have some vector and you can uh, you can represent a vector as a, um, a partial derivative. So you have some D sigma, that's just some vector. Um, and then, so if I start at P, I could transport to Q and then I could transport to R. And I can compare, um, so I'll end up at some, um, that D row will end up somewhere, that, that vector will end up somewhere, right? And, but then I could also go from P to S to R and compare where I end up. Right. If I go from P to Q to R versus P S to R, you want to compare the difference of those vectors, right? And so, if there's curvature in your space time, basically, when you transport those two vectors and come back to the same spot, if the two vectors are rotated between each other, then that is a characterization of curvature, and you would say that this curvature is associated to the area of that loop. So um, that helps to give some intuition for how. Uh, the, the Riemann curvature tensor is, is formed, basically you have this area, you have the vector you're transporting, and then you have the difference of the vectors after transport. And that helps describe why the Riemann tensor is a four tensor, basically because you have two indices for the area, one index for the initial vector, and one index for the difference between the final vectors. So we see that curvature is intimately related to rotation. For torsion, on the other hand, um, you don't actually need to even think about transporting a vector, but it's a little simpler than that where you, but what if you went from P to Q and then you went to Q to R and you, let's say you, you just went in the X direction in the Y direction, right? But then you started at P and you went in the Y direction and then the X direction. If you turned out that you took the same translation vectors and you end up at two different points, which is kind of weird to think about, right? Like if you go left, left or if you go right and then up and then you go up and right, you should end up at the same spot. But if you don't, then that is a characterization of torsion. So you can measure the difference between the two points. And basically if that difference is zero, then there's no torsion. And 
uh, once again, the, the, air, the area is associated with the torsion. So the torsion would be ascribed to this area that you transported around. And basically the change in uh, the, the change in the final positions um, gives you another index. So you get this torsion three tensor and we see that it's intimately related to translations because uh, basically you, you went and transported one way and you ended up in a different spot than you thought. So you'd have to translate to end up where you were aiming for. So this, this is another type of geometry that you can have. And then there's also non-metricity, which it is, this is, this is the weirdest one. Basically, you don't even need to consider transport on a, vec, on, a, on a loop. You just go on an open line. So if you go from P to Q, you could imagine taking two arbitrary vectors, A and B, and you could see how their dot product changes as you are transported over an open line interval. So basically, if the dot product changes, then that is a characterization of non-metricity. And that, that also ends up being a three tensor for a slightly different reason than torsion basics because you have to consider two vectors and you're transporting on this open line, which um, infinitesimal you could go along in the direction of a vector. So um, that, that describes non-metricity and basically it leads to variation in length and angles. So it's, it's pretty bizarre because Usually you like to calibrate rulers and say you have this invariant notion of length. So um, this is probably why you might not have heard of this before because it's pretty, pretty bizarre geometry to have, but it can lead to uh, scaling and shearing effects in, in your geometry. So I figured um, since we're gonna talk about some, um, some concept of energy and warp drive and stuff like that, I figured it worth mentioning uh, energy conservation or conservation laws in general, uh, thanks to Emmy Noether. And basically there's this, this notion that for every symmetry, you get a conserved quantity. So if you want your laws of physics to be invariant over time, um, you know, you know, if we wake up today or we go to the next day, the theory that we're using shouldn't have to be changed. We want this universal theory that works every day of the week. So that actually defines what energy should be. It's the conserved quantity associated with the laws of physics being invariant over time. Similarly, momentum is conserved because uh, physical laws are constant over space. And you could uh, do a similar thing to talk about angular momentum and rotation. But these are local conservation laws. So um, when you consider energy conservation, right, in thermodynamics, you look at heat coming out of a process or something like that, right? You're looking at the local events of what are going on and you're tracing apart like where the energy goes from here to here in a local sense. Um, and general relativity has some bizarre properties in the fact that you do have local conservation, but the global energy, um, the global energy basically is not conserved. One simple way to see this, especially for an expanding universe, is that we assume that there's this constant uh, dark energy density, and then the volume is increasing. So if you have a constant energy density, the, the, the total energy is the volume times the density. And if the volume is increasing and the density is constant, the total energy is increasing. And I think there's probably other ways to see this in general relativity without expanding the universe as well, just from looking at the gravitational interaction interactions. But basically general relativity has a lot of conceptual difficulties associated with it because of this um, notion of global energy violation. It's at a point where maybe, maybe 50, 100 years ago, people were more concerned with this, but you know, after a theory becomes popular and is used for a while, people start to get more comfortable with the problems. But it, it, it leads to a lot of confusion because um, people like to think of global energy conservation as being uh, conserved. So I think a lot of the controversies coming out of general relativity, a lot of times they're related to this. Um, they'll think about observers and get confused about if the observer is locally close to something or very far away. Um, there's a lot of different apparent paradoxes that can come out from a misunderstanding of this, but it's not necessarily a problem, but I think uh, it motivates that there could be better formulations that might have a more uh, sensible global energy conservation as well. So I figured I'd also briefly mention symmetries because um, I'm gonna mention a bunch of different gauge theories of gravity and those involve different symmetry groups. So Newtonian dynamics um, had Galilean symmetry of space, whereas Einstein's relativity introduced this space time. So it unified space and time and that generalized the, the, the symmetry group to a space time symmetry, which uh, has Lorentzian symmetry. And so this is just the notation used for the special orthogonal group, which describes rotations. And so basically you can also add the space time translations themselves 
and that leads to Poincaré symmetry. So Poincaré symmetry is the Lorentz symmetry plus the spacetime translations. And just to get a simple idea for what I'm talking about, um, you could imagine rotating all of space at every location as a global transformation. You rotate everything everywhere. And basically, the, you know, the dynamics shouldn't change. If I change a different frame and I rotate from one frame to another, that shouldn't change. And similarly, these uh, symmetry groups relate to the symmetries of a sphere, right? So if I have SO3, that describes three-dimensional rotations. I have a sphere embedded in, uh, in three dimensions. If I rotate that sphere uh, about any axis, as long as the axis goes through the origin of the sphere, you know, the, the sphere is gonna be invariant. It's gonna stay the same. You, if you rotate a sphere, you can't tell if it changed. So that's this notion of, you know, invariance asymmetry. When you, you change something and then you apply some transformation and no change occurs, then, then you have a symmetry. But then there's also these local or gauge symmetries. Um, some examples of these are these unitary groups, which are basically orthogonal groups, except with complex numbers instead of real numbers. And this gets used in electrodynamics. And also the standard model has some more complicated uh, local gauge symmetry. And so you could also consider, well, what about gauge gravity? Can I gauge the Lorentz group? Can I gauge the Poincaré group? So those are studied in, in various uh, fields, uh, supergravity and string theory, loop quantum gravity, uh, pure gravity community. There's all these different subfields that are looking at various different gauge gravity theories, but um, a lot of people just don't, uh, yeah, I feel like it, it's not something that gets across to the public very often that, that these theories exist and that they're being explored. And so a local symmetry you could consider, instead of applying a transformation such as a rotation, everywhere in space, you could just apply it locally, just at a single point. So if you're at a certain position, you could apply that transformation where you are, rotate. Um, it's, it's, it's not like you're rotating yourself, you're actually changing your coordinates. And a, in a, it's, it's a hard way to visualize, but imagine changing the coordinates such that the coordinates of things only change in some local region instead of everywhere. And that's the basic idea. And Einstein talk, eventually talked about this notion of uh, diffeomorphism invariance, which is basically this idea that you can choose any frame of reference. It doesn't have to be some global uh, transformation between these frames. So you could argue that Einstein really was um, going for some gauge theory of gravity, but just never quite got there. And maybe he did to some degree with some of his uh, later formulations. So basically, general relativity has this global Lorentz symmetry. And you can consider gauge theories of gravity, which create this local symmetry. And the, the idea th to think about it is if you can apply a local symmetry, then you can apply a global symmetry because you could apply that symmetry locally and you could apply the same local symmetry everywhere in space, which would then lead to some global symmetry. Whereas the global symmetries are, um, you know, there's more freedom in the local uh, gauge transformations than in the global transformations. So the gauge theory of gravity, theories of gravity kind of go beyond and these are very useful for quantum gravity and also have different um, properties about the global conservation. So it seems at least to how well I understand it this far. So I figured I would kind of go through some of the fundamentals of general relativity. Basically, we have this principle of relativity, which is the principle of general co covariance, which is saying that the physical laws should be invariant with respect to change of coordinates, as I was saying. So um, basically, you, you start considering changes in uh, these inertial frames, basically boosting to constant velocities that led to special relativity. And eventually you could consider accelerated frames. And then it was realized that, you know, you had this equivalence principle where basically if you're in, in this accelerated frame, if you're in free fall, um, you won't even feel your own, own weight. So it's uh, basically gravity is indistinguishable from acceleration in some sense. And that, that led to general relativity. And GR also has this, um, this global symmetry that it's associated. Sometimes this is stated as being related to the diffeomorphism invariance that it's this general linear group. Basically, it's just arbitrary four by four matrices that can act on space time. And so the, the Lorentz transformations are a subgroup in this GL4R. And this metric affine gravity takes uh, as a gauge group, this general linear group, and then adds translations to that, and it, it's it's a local gauge symmetry. So this metric affine gauge gravity uh, formalism uh, contains curvature, torsion, and non-metricity, and um, is uses this fairly large uh, gauge group. So, you know, let's stick to general relativity. Basically, um, uh, okay. So 
we have this principle. And so you could ask yourself, what is general relativity? Is it the theory or is it the principle? So uh, I think it makes sense to try to preserve Einstein's legacy as much as possible, just out of respect, sorry for that. And uh, because you know he, he did find the first theory that led to the, the perihelion of Mercury. So that's, that's a good result. And basically you can argue that the most general theory of, rel maybe, maybe Einstein chose a bad name for calling it general relativity. Maybe he had this nice principle, he had a theory, and there's really this more general theory of relativity that, that could come in the future. And maybe it should contain this local diffeomorphism variance to truly get that notion of arbitrary frames uh, associated with uh, his principle of general covariance. So at, 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 at a minimum, you can say that this uh, metric affine gravity formulas, formalism has linearized local diffeomorphism transformations. Um, so you know, what I'm talking about today, it's going to seem pretty complicated and it's just, it's just first order, you know, imagine you could have a linear function, you have a quadratic, uh, cubic quartic, you could keep going to infinity. I'm just going to talk about linear gauge transformations and that we're going to see there's a wide range of theories, but really we probably want to go beyond the linear gauge transformations one day, but you know, we got to take it one step at a time. So basically if quantizing GR fails, then we can uh, still preserve Einstein's legacy and pursue uh, the most general theory of relativity that is still following up on Einstein's philosophy and his principle in some way. And I figured I'd at least throw out a shout out to Heaviside because uh, he was the he introduced a first theory of gravity that predicted gravitational waves using Maxwell's equations. Um, but as far as I can tell, if anyone finds a com computation that actually gets the perihelion of Mercury correct, I would like to see it. Um, Hefemenko claimed that it worked, uh, but no, he didn't get it. He didn't calculate it. Maybe, maybe that more calculations could be done, but I haven't seen anything. There are a lot of people that claim it can be made to work, but I haven't seen it. Um, general relativity it certainly was the first theory to um, find a solution. And basically we can keep on going with these more complicated theories. And another, another interesting point is that this metric affine gravity theory is actually an elastic theory of gauge gravity. So we're actually imagining this, uh, this frame of space-time as this elastic medium. And an elastic medium is basically a fluid, except you have small displacements. So um, that, that might relate to the linearity of the, the gauge group. We're just going to allow for very small deformations and keep things very small in some sense. And so if you want to get all ethereal about it, you could say that this fictitious medium um, is the ether. And because gauge theory, it's usually stated that the symmetry itself associated with the gauge symmetry is a gauge redundancy, implying that the, the gauge symmetry is unphysical or not real in some sense. So it's kind of funny to look back on history and think of Einstein removing the ether, but then um, you know, basically failing to realize that there's all this freedom that you could get from keeping it in, but still uh, pretending that it's not a real thing, but using the mathematics associated with it. And in my opinion, I don't even subscribe to the idea that gauge theory is implying that it's unphysical, but that's kind of the mainstream consensus. So um, I think it makes sense to at least put this perspective out there because then you can say that you have this ether theory where the ether doesn't exist. And then if that gets established, maybe in 50 years later, someone could say, hey, well, there's actually something here. Maybe the ether does exist. Maybe it is physical, but one step at a time. So for this talk, I'll say the ether does sort of exist mathematically, but not physically per se. And so we could continue with a little crash course with general relativity and we can unify space and time into this space time four vector. It leads to what's called hyperbolic geometry. It's non Euclidean because uh, basically the signature associated with time, even in flat space time and special relativity, when you start measuring lengths, the time comes in and the fact that you get a minus sign here and a plus sign here, uh, denotes that you have hyperbolic geometry. But in general relativity, it's even more complicated. You get this uh, curved space time, you get this metric tensor G mu nu. And um, so this, this is a generalization of the flat space time. And uh, yeah, this is a helpful picture for thinking of uh, space like separated uh, foliation. So you could imagine taking like discrete time slices and then um, kind of breaking this up in here and then separating space and time again within the framework of general relativity. That's something that's commonly done, especially for quantum gravity and also the Alcubierre drive. So 
The next thing to look at is after this, after you have this metric, you have a connection and this leads to a covariant derivative. So you, okay, you have derivatives and calculus, right? That tells you about rates of change. But now when you're, you're transporting on this curved manifold, you need this de derivative that transforms properly because everything is curved and you get this connection. It's a pseudo tensor, it's called, it doesn't transform like a tensor. For instance, a uh, tensor um, has transformation properties associated with the Lorentz transformations, right? So if I have some vector, I can transform it with a Lorentz transformation and bring me from one frame to another. And the values of the vectors will be different in the different frames of reference, but the, the Lorentz transformations tell us how to convert the information from one frame to the other such that we can figure out how to calibrate everything so everyone agrees on what is actually happening. And so when you have curved space-time, you want to make sure you have these vectors and tensors that transform properly. And so um, basically, if anytime you have a derivative, you're going to need this covariant derivative in order to get tensors that transform properly, and that involves this connection. And um, basically, you can then look at the acceleration of different particles in some curved space-time manifold, and this connection ends up, basically, it's kind of like a force equation. This is kind of like F equals MA, except in GR, it's called a fictitious force. So we're seeing gravity, basically, if the connection vanished, then um, there would be no gravity. And so the fact that the connection is here, if that was finite, you know, you would get this gravitational fictitious force that would be encapsulated in this term. And then from here, I'll just mention that GR is metric compatible, which means that it has vanishing non-metricity. You get this non-metricity tensor. That's this three tensor that I talked about before that has to do with the variable uh, length of rulers. And in general relativity, it, well, in arbitrary theories, the, the non-metricity tensor is the covariant derivative of the metric tensor, but this vanishes in general relativity. So there's also this notion of torsion, this torsion three tensor, um, you could take this uh, connection here and then generalize the connection of the, this affine connection. It's the same thing. Just pretend these two are the same thing. And if you uh, just basically uh, subtract uh, two of these affine connections and switch two of the indices, take this anti-symmetric piece here, you'll find that in general relativity, this torsion tensor will vanish. And what's kind of actually remarkable is the fact that although um, this affine connection here is not a tensor, this torsion tensor actually is a valid tensor that transforms properly, which is kind of interesting. So yeah, GR basically has curvature, but it doesn't have non-metricity and it doesn't have torsion. So from here, once we have our metric, we have our connection, we can then talk about a curvature tensor and there's different types. Basically, you can take a combination of derivatives of the, the, the affine connection to get uh, the Riemann curvature tensor as a four tensor because it has four different indices of space-time, but then you can contract two of those indices. It's kind of like taking a trace of a matrix. Like if you have a matrix, let's say an N by N matrix, you take a trace, you add up all the elements on the diagonal, and then you just get this single number, this scalar. And so you can generalize that concept to arbitrarily higher tensors. So if you have a four tensor, you can contract two indices and get this two tensor. This, re this is called the Ricci curvature two tensor. That's found in Einstein's field equations. And then you can also take another contraction here, and then you get the, the, the Ricci curvature scalar, which also appears in Einstein's field equations. And then, so we have this field equation where we get our, we're getting curvature, but something has to source that curvature. And so we get this energy momentum stress tensor that is the source. And basically all of matter is formulated in terms of its energy and its momentum and its stress. And from there, that leads to the sourcing of curvature of space-time. So matter is what curves space-time, and then space-time, as it's curved, uh, you know, moves matter. And because this is, ends up being a differential equation that is nonlinear, you get this very, it's pretty complicated to work with Einstein's field equations uh, because of the nonlinearity. So sometimes it helps to, to make approximations where you start where everything is small and you kind of pretend everything's flat, and then you just source a little bit of stuff, and you kind of go back and forth. So you see how matter curves space-time, you see how that affects matter, and you can kind of push things to both sides of the equation and get more accurate predictions by doing things in a more simpler way. So in general relativity, there is this levi civita connection. There's all these different types of connections. There's Carton connections, affine connections, blah, 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 right? Okay, so 
In general relativity, there is this levi civita connection, which is also called Christoffel symbols. They're the same thing. And this is uniquely determined by the metric. So you just take partial derivatives of the metric and contract indices in this way, and you get this levi civita connection. And this is what goes into the, the, the covariant derivative. So this helps uh, describe transport, I was saying. And this is just reiterating the geodesic equation where you get this acceleration term and the, the fictitious force. And this is just showing the mathematics for the, the Riemann curvature tensor. Basically, you take derivatives of the, the, the connection, let's say the affine connection. Basically, the idea is the affine connection is more general. But in general relativity, the affine connection gets reduced to levi civita connection. So they're, they're the same thing in some sense, especially in general relativity. So then um, these, these terms also appear here. This actually, if you have looked at Yang-Mills theory, which is related to all the other forces of nature, this looks very much like Yang-Mills theory. So um, you know, everyone talks about how Einstein failed at actually unifying stuff, but you know, we didn't understand that there were these other forces of nature related to Yang-Mills theory until really right around the year that Einstein died that was being discovered. So I think if Einstein stayed alive for another couple of decades, he would have really figured all of this out. And OK, so we have this Ricci tensor and Ricci scalar, as I described. And you get in, in physics, especially classical physical or quantum physics, well, you get this action, which is in terms of this Lagrangian. And this derives all of the dynamics. So you, you have this action principle that is uh, this principle of least action, which is an optimization procedure where you're considering different paths. You consider all possible paths that you could take. And you're trying to find the classical solution as a particular path, right? Like we want to predict the future. We specify some initial conditions. And we want to see how the particle evolves through space time, let's say, right? So we want to consider all possible paths. And then basically, you can do these uh, calculus of variations to look at this. And you can get this simple term here. It just involves the Ricci scalar. And this is just some um, thing to have a, a nice volume, basically, because uh, usually you just integrate over space time. But since uh, space time is curved, you have to include this uh, determinant of the metric just to, to get aspects of that. And then you could add terms for matter. And the, the Newton's uh, gravitational constant g is encoded in this coupling constant, cap, constant kappa here. And it, for the most part, you just have this integral over r. So that's pretty much the simplest action you could consider out of uh, curvature. And this is just uh, Einstein's field equations again. And um, you can derive that from, from that action there. And so it turns out that the curvature is two derivatives of the metric tensor. So you get the second order differential wave equation. Basically, second order differential equations are wave equations. So you can get gravitational waves coming out of here. And we, it's worth talking a little bit more about the, the energy momentum tensor. Blah, blah, blah. You have this action for matter. And you apply this variation with respect to the metric that, that, that describes how matter is encoded. Sorry for the mathematical details. But uh, it's worth pointing out historically, basically, this is called a stress tensor. And it's kind of curious, because where, why, are we, why are we calling it a stress tensor? Where did this come from in physics? And so as a little quiz question, I could ask, well, what, you know, what was the first theory of physics with a stress tensor? Or what theory discusses the relationship of stress and strain? I'll just pause for about five, 10 seconds, you know, let you think about it. Basically, elasticity theory was that theory. And so it's kind of curious looking into it. You know, you, you hear about the ether maybe as being some elastic medium, you know, but then Einstein banished that, yet we have this stress energy momentum tensor. So mathematically, it does seem like something came along for the ride. So you could then ask, well, what, what the heck does elasticity have to do with gravity, right? We have this stress tensor. Where's the strain, right? And basically, the, the one answer you could ask, uh, you, you could reply with, is that this metric affine gravity theory is relativistic elasticity theory. And then you can actually interpret the metric tensor as being strain, the strain associated with the medium. Strain is basically like the, the displacements that you apply. So it relates to the, like the physical changes in length that occur from you know, deforming a medium. And then the stress relates to the forces required to cause those displacements. So that kind of makes a lot of sense now. We have this stress tensor, and that's related to the forces required to cause that strain or the change in the metric or the curvature. 
So yeah, we got some more math from the theory of elasticity. The basic idea is that you have this position vector x, and then you can deform it with a small displacement. So this, this and you can do it locally. So at every, you know, you could just imagine a rigid body that can oscillate a little, right? As it's oscillating, you're getting these local displacements of any, any physical material that you're thinking of. And you could measure the length uh, and, you know, you can imagine atoms in a lattice, right? The atoms are oscillating and you could measure how the, the, the length between those atoms are changing over time. And so you could say that um, basically you get this change in length, which is kind of weird. This is, this is where it starts to look different than general relativity because general relativity is simpler than the, the elasticity theory. But this theory is simpler than relativity because it only has space, it has no time. But when you look at the mathematics of this strain tensor, it turns out uh, that basically the idea is this, you have this local displacement as some vector field, and then you have some partial derivative. And another way to write this partial derivative is just uh, instead of ddx j, you could just write it as del j, that little uh, partial symbol right there. And so here we have mu, which is a four-dimensional index. This i was meant to be a three-dimensional index. So general relativity has this, uh, this, this gauge-like transformation. It's very funny when you're you'll read these books and sometimes they'll, everyone knows that GR is not a gauge theory and then they'll sometimes refer to this as a gauge transformation. And it's like, no one really knows what they're talking, like they just kind of say it. Um, you know, a lot of the experts really do know what they're talking about. There's a lot of really smart people that don't know what's going on here. And it's because um, you can consider diffeomorphism transformations and it really is a gauge symmetry implying that general relativity should be replaced by some gauge gravity theory. but even in general relativity textbooks, you'll see stuff like this sometimes, which looks very similar to the partial derivatives here. You just have a, a symmetric uh, component indices. And in fact, uh, you won't see this term right here. So in a sense, GR is simpler than the elasticity theory because there's an additional term here. And basically th this leads to, basically we need more mathematics. All of the gauge theories use uh, these linear terms and so uh, this is a second order term. And so we need really complicated mathematics that I'm not gonna get into in this talk to actually nail the, the gauge gravity. Uh, I should have put this slide earlier, sorry for this, but this is just a quick, uh, quick sketch of the derivation of Einstein field equations from the Einstein-Hilbert action. Basically you, uh, you vary uh, the metric and then you, 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 you vary the action with respect to variations of the metric and you can cleverly get it to pop out. But I'm not gonna focus on this in, in too much detail, but it's, it's actually a fun exercise to go through. And okay, I just wanted to also mention this frame field formulation because uh, this is needed for matter. When you have spin, when you have fermions, like electrons are fermions and Dirac in 1928 introduced this Dirac equation that used this Dirac spinner. And it's really remarkable. I mean, no one, most people don't even realize that Einstein did this right away in 1928. Most people attribute this, uh, this frame field formulation to other people, maybe Weil. And, but it turns out there, it, it took until 2011 until it was actually translated, Einstein's paper was translated to English. So, I mean, this is just more evidence to me that Einstein is, you know, he is a genius in the sense that as soon as someone comes out, with this new, uh, you know, this new equation for the electron, he immediately figures out the right geometry needed for uh, dealing with that. And this, this is so. This frame field formulation is studied. It's very common in theories beyond general relativity. And the basic idea is that the spin one half Dirac particle is like <laughs> the 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 action is the, the the differential operator is kind of like a square root of a spin zero particle. So. And so Einstein had this idea, well, let me take a square root of the metric tensor and you get this frame field. It's also called a Feuerbein in German for four legs or a tetrad uh, for in four dimensions. Frame field is um, more universal in arbitrary dimensions, but basically you can kind of factorize this metric tensor into this frame field uh, times another frame field with different indices. And then you can contract it with this other metric in some other space. So it's, it's common to basically consider curved space time here and then imagine this eta AB as some different space time where everything is flat. You don't have to do that, but you can. It's con most of the time people consider this one to be flat. So you could have Minkowski space and then you can see how this is really like a deformation, right? Like you have flat space time 
and then you're deforming it into this curved space time and you can go back and forth. So you have these kind of uh, local indices here and these global indices here. And it can sometimes be convenient to use these indices for the gauge theory. And basically you have this metric tensor and you have this affine connection. Um, I'll just point out that in metric affine gravity, it's called that because the, the metric tensor and the affine connection are independent. So um, the affine connection also splits apart into this spin connection, this omega here in this frame field. Um, so yeah, you can use these different formulations even within the same theory. So you can have general relativity and you could use, you could either apply the frame field formulation or not. But it, it seems that you basically need this formulation to deal with spinners in curved space time, which we have. So um, that, that, that's helpful. And basically another, another formulation you can do commonly studied with frame fields is what's called a first order formulation. So in general relativity, you have this action in terms of the curvature tensor, and that depends on the metric, which is two derivative. When you take a first derivative of the metric, you can combine that in different ways to get the connection. And then you can take another round of derivatives. You have some spin connection here. You could take another derivative here to get this curvature tensor. So typically, um, GR is called a second order formulation because they have uh, those two derivatives. But you can kind of replace the metric as being the dynamical field with this affine connection or the spin connection. So you have the spin connection be the dynamical field. And now it's quote unquote first order because you have this Lagrangian. It's the same exact thing. I mean, this is just a metric tensor essentially that's contracting indices. You still have this curvature tensor. It's the same theory, but within the different formulation, you then uh, treat it first order and then you vary with respect to the connection rather than the metric. And um, that, that, lead, that makes it more like other theories in certain ways, such as uh, yang Mills theory. And so, okay, you can have different connections and the next thing, let's let's kind of we're going to transition away from general relativity for a bit. So, um, another common theory is this Einstein-Cartan theory. It, within that theory, it's the same exact Lagrangian, except now you you when you go to the first order formulation, we allow for this affine connection, and when you study that, you realize that the affine connection can contain torsion, in general. So now I have this Levi-Civita connection plus this contorsion tensor, which contains the torsional contributions to the affine connection. And so then you can say, well, I have this larger theory. And if you keep this uh, to be basically the Einstein-Hilbert action you it with the, the affine connection here, you'll get Einstein's field equations. And then you'll get this additional equation where the spin density sources torsion. And what you find there is that the torsion is only inside matter. And it's not even this, you don't even get like a, a, a wave equation for the torsion. It's just like, uh, you know, there's no calculus. It's just A equals B. And so whatever the spin density is, that immediately determines the torsion. So in Einstein-Cartan theory, which is very commonly studied and people ignore, the they try to ignore the fact that they're actually studying it. They'll pretend it's general relativity when they're actually studying Einstein-Cartan theory. And in this theory, when you have your Dirac fermions coupled with it, wherever there's a spin density that creates torsion around it. And this is kind of mind blowing because it's, it's sort of anti-gravitic in a way. I don't know if I would literally say that, but it sort of is anti-gravitic in some sense. And so when you when you study rotating black holes, in um, if you go into literature and you really dig into the details, you're never going to see them talking about torsion. But it, there's actually torsion hidden behind the scenes in, in a lot of these studies. So it's one of those things where it seems like it's her, like it seems like it's heretical. There's I mean I think one of the main problems was a lot of Russians study it during the Cold War. So there became this polarization around, oh, torsion physics like isn't a good idea. But it's used ubiquitously in string theory. It's used in loop quantum gravity. Well, loop quantum gravity doesn't include matter, but there was a paper that showed you basically need torsion in Einstein-Cartan theory if you want to add matter to loop quantum gravity. So like anyone who's attempting anything in quantum gravity, basically they're struggling because they're forgetting about the torsion. Um, this is just more mathematics about the Lorentz group transformations. Um, basically, you have the Lorentz group. There's this Poincaré group that adds the translations. And the translations, uh, space-time translations, are related to momentum. Momentum is called P sometimes, so that's why they call it P. Um, and then I'm not going to, don't worry about this too much. And just to briefly motivate gauge gravity, uh, furthermore, just because you might not hear about it a lot, but basically, 
supergravity is a gauge theory. Uh, that's in string theory. So string theory is a gauge theory. Loop quantum gravity is a gauge theory. Uh, you know, Poincaré gauge gravity is studied. That's gauge theory. Metric affine gravity is a gauge theory. Geometric algebra, that's this other community. They have their own mathematical way of looking at things, and then they study gravity, and then they get a gauge theory of gravity. General relativity is technically not a gauge theory, but it's you can break the gauge symmetry and recover general relativity. And so basically, like any, any, in my opinion, any interesting theory of gravity that I've seen in academia that people are studying, a lot of them are gauge theories of gravity. And so you can have all these different gauge groups, um, different symmetry groups, right? So that SO31 was the special orthogonal group for uh, rotations of space and time because you have three space dimensions and one time dimension. And there's this mathematical detail where you use this double cover for spinners. Uh, the spinners are spin one half. So it's kind of like you have this spin up and spin down that motivates this double cover. They actually have the same algebra but are technically a different group. And so whenever you see spin P comma Q, it's basically the same thing as SO. And then there's all these different isomorphisms like these relate these equalities that you can find. So you can consider like special linear transformations over complex numbers for two by two matrices. It turns out coincidentally that just mathematically is the same thing as this. So then there's all these theories revolving around SL2C. That's very close to the spinners, right? Like the Dirac spinners have uh, four component spinners and those four component spinners uh, break into two two component spinners where this SL2C will act on that. And then there's also these, maybe you've heard of Aztecker variables that's kind of studying loop quantum gravity that uses this uh, complexification of SU2, which also is the same thing as the Lorentz group. So three different ways to re represent the Lorentz group. And then there's also this Poincaré gauge gravity that adds the translations. It's kind of cool. You can actually fit the translations into this five dimensional rotation group. Um, you can do it with three comma two or four comma one. And then, uh, uh, you know, some super groups, who cares about that for the moment? <laughs> um, there's conformal gravity. Uh, you can take the conformal group, which it turns out um, that's basically any area preserving transformation. So you can get scale transformations that increase the scale, but the angles would be preserved. And those are conformal transformations. Those are beyond the Lorentz group. And it turns out you can add like a light cone, like one space dimension and one time dimension. So, excuse me, the conformal group of three plus one dimensions is this spin four comma two group. So you could gauge that symmetry as well, and get conformal gauge gravity. And then it turns out that spin four comma two is the same thing as SU22. And SU22, so I mean, that's complex, unitary relates to complex matrices. And they have this two, two. You know, I was talking about that four component spinner, that Dirac spinner. Um, basically, Penrose's twisters, maybe you've heard of Penrose's twisters. Those are spinners of the conformal group, which now makes a little bit more sense because the conformal group is uh, basically you, it's, it's four by four complex matrices acting on this four component spinner or a twister, which is basically the same thing as a massless Dirac spinner. So if you imagine at high energies, if you have a lot of kinetic energy, you can just kind of ignore the mass and then it makes everything easier when everything's massless. And then you can look at twisters as uh, basically massless Dirac spinners. And then uh, there are these other groups, uh, GL4R and Yang of Yang Mills theory. He's a famous physicist, uh, studied this theory of gravity that gauged GL4R back in 1974. There was a lot of confusion about that. Most people thought the theory didn't work, but maybe it actually does. Um, and then there's also this affine linear group that adds the translations to the general linear group, as I was saying. So, okay, uh, basically there's all this amazing work on metric affine gravity. Um, if you add torsion, you can get um, nice properties for um, how that relates to spin density, as I was mentioning, and that relates to torsion. And then um, there's also this interesting work by Poplowski where he found that the photon, when you have it in curved space time, it leads to non-metricity. So now we have our curvature for energy, our, um, our spin for torsion, and our charge for non-metricity, kind of at a high level. Like if you look at a black hole, a black hole can only have mass spin and charge. Maybe that motivates these three different geometries. And there's also this thesis that is quite fun and complicated that presents this unification of the standard model with uh, kind of loop quantum gravity. And they, uh, they describe how the Higgs mass, the gravitational constant, and the cosmological constant are all unified into this single scalar field, which is absolutely mind-blowing to me. So um, that's 
it's, it's very suggestive for unification. That's why I like this geometry. And um, you could also look at um, quantum parallel transport and get into membranes and motivate it from that angle. Uh, so I like to think of metric affine gravity as kind of like driving a Ferrari. You know, it's, it's really nice when you got it working nicely, but it's kind of a bitch to get all the maintenance working properly. You really got to know what you're doing. You got to have a good mechanic, a good mathematician who really knows what's going on under the hood. Uh, one way to think about it roughly, this might be a slight oversimplification. In general relativity, you, you typically have this base manifold, and then you consider these tangent vectors, and you consider um, this tangent bundle, which is a collection of all the tangent planes on the manifold. So you have, and, and the tangent planes are nice to work with because everything is flat there. And so you can kind of think of that tangent bundle as being a collection of separate tangent planes, or you could think of sliding a single tangent plane to different places and describing how maybe the sliding changes the properties there. Or you could um, look at these affine spaces and a lot of cases there you'll find that they'll think of something like a sphere as a tangent manifold that's rolling on top of the base manifold. So you have this tangent space as some its own manifold that's rolling um, you know, around the, the, the base manifold of space-time. And so that's a different uh, construction, a uh, different you know, way to visualize what's going on. And finally, this metric affine space uh, combines both of them. And so you could imagine you could have like slipping and rolling. Like if you've studied class mechanics, when you study a ball rolling down a hill, it's much easier to just assume there's no slipping, right? And then, then it makes everything easier. Or you could just say, what if it only slips but doesn't roll? That's a lot simpler, but if you allow for slipping and rolling, it, it's kind of at first glance ambiguous about, well, how much is it gonna slip? How much is it gonna roll, right? And then if this entire framework is this fictitious medium that doesn't even matter, right? Like it's just this mathematical tool that we're using, we can allow for arbitrary slipping and rolling however we like, and maybe find different um, desirable, um, maybe it helps mathematically, who knows, right? So maybe these metric affine theories are kind of like the Ferrari of gravitational theories. Um, so this is the best picture I could find of Friedrich Hell. You could see maybe he's, why is he so angry? Well, it's because he did a lot of the pioneering work on metric affine gravity. <laughs> and uh, basically you, you have to ask all these deep questions when you're studying this, like how do we even define length and angle? Like which covariant derivative? Because like you could have the Levi-Civita connection you have all these connections. So like, which connection should I use? Like, should I just restrict to what Einstein had? Should I add the torsion? Should I add the non matricity Should I use both? Should I consider, you know, the one Einstein have and then use the total affine connection and use both of those and reconcile something different, right? You have to think about all these things. And then it gets even more complicated. Not only do we have this curvature tensor, this torsion tensor, and this non matricity tensor, we get different curvature tensors because we can decide, well, like how much of the affine connection do I want to go into the curvature? And so when you start going in the literature, it's very difficult to make any sense of it because everyone is just simple, you know, no one's going to the top of the mountain and seeing what the most general thing is. They're all just trying one thing at a time and everyone's using different notations. It takes forever to disentangle all this. And this is why it's taking, you know, a hundred years for us to figure this out. And I'm not even gonna mention this final point. Um, you know, there's, there's a million things you could, it, it really opens the door on a lot of different possibilities for questions you have to ask. So just to kind of uh, break down this affine linear group, you can imagine having some space-time vector and you're gonna transform it to some other space-time vector. And you're maybe let's say you multiply by some matrix. Some matrix is uh, some thing with two components. It's a two tensor. And so you can have these generators of the general linear group as matrix transformations. And then you could imagine uh, translations as just adding something, right? Like if I have space and I just shift everything over by some constant value, then that's just adding something, right? That's what this B mu prime is doing here. And what's kind of remarkable is you can embed all of this in the five dimensions and just think of, uh, oh, sorry, I should have, I'm missing a vector here. I should have put, I keep, <laughs> keep presenting this and keep noticing this and forgetting to fix it. There should be like a, an X and a one here. So this, if this is a four by four matrix, this is just like a four vector. You can embed the four by four matrix and the four vector into this five by five matrix and then have it act on this five dimensional vector that I forgot to write here as X and one. And that would give us our X prime and one. And then you just throw away the one, 
and then you got you know you got your four dimensions again see so now you see like people talking about extra dimensions here's the utilization of five dimensions it's just some math trick right and so you have this affine linear group you can break that down to the poincare group and that would isolate spin three comma one and leave the translations or you could just remove the translations and get this general linear group and then both of those contain the lorentz group and um, yeah, that's just showing the commutation relations. I'm not going to focus on that too much, but you know, you can work through mathematics for how these uh, you get matrix representations for the generators, and they satisfy certain relations. But yeah, this is basically decomposing. I'll mention this: you have uh, this L as your matrix, uh, your generators for your matrix transformations of the general linear group. You can decompose it into symmetric matrices and anti-symmetric matrices, and it turns out that the anti-symmetric generators are associated with the Lorentz group. Those uh, the the gem you knew are are what I'm using for the generators of the Lorentz group, and those those are used for space time. And so there's other ways you can break down AL four R as well. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but um, you can also get three time dimensions hidden in here in this clever thing that I like to study. Um, so then you can kind of look at the subsectors of metric affine gravity with this affine linear group and start to break it down. And basically, you can pull out this uh, Lorentz group and associate it with curvature. And it's understood that the translations uh, naturally relate to torsion. And so basically whatever is left has to be for non-metricity, which is this coset. It's not even a group, it's not even closed. So yeah, if you go in the literature and you look, I'll, I'll mention this theory of non-metricity. They don't, they don't say what the gauge group is. It, you know, it'd be nice if someone talked about the gauge transformations of this theory of non-metricity, but they're struggling because they don't even know what group to choose, probably because it's not even a group. It's this coset. You got to take this group and then remove generators out of it, and it doesn't even close. So uh, that's just a little technical detail. And so if you have this affine connection A right here, you could decompose it into the levi civita connection and this contortion tensor and this disformation tensor. More buzzwords. Uh, but there's, I tried to show this slide because it does outline a simplicity that I haven't seen anyone write it in this simple of a way. If you look at the indices here, they're all the same. The structure is the same. Like you have plus, you have these terms, just one term plus, plus, minus, plus, plus, minus. The structure of the levi civita connection, the contortion, and the disformation is all the same. It's just that what goes into them is a little bit different. Here, we just have the uh, partial derivatives of the metric that leads to this levi civita connection. This is the torsion tensor. If we uh, combine the torsion tensor in this way, we get the contortion tensor. And then this is the non-metricity tensor. Non-metricity can cause um, you know, scaling and shearing, so it can maybe disform things, perhaps. And so this is called the disformation tensor. So this kind of at least gives you a little bit of, uh, I mean, there are all these tensors, it's a little complicated, but there's at least a little bit of, of hope in seeing the simplicity that these three things all sort of are the same mathematically in some sense. They have similar structure. And so these uh, those covariant derivatives now involve this affine connection here. And if you study yang mills theory, there's going to be a covariant derivative there. And they'll often write it like this. And this is the, uh, this is the matrix formulation, formulation of the yang mills theory. So if you had QCD, you'd have eight gluons and three quarks. It turns out you could represent the, the operators for those gluons as three by three matrices. And that I and J would be um, components of those three by three matrices. So this would be like a collection of three quarks. You have a three dimensional vector of color space, right? And you have this, uh, it's just a vector in space time with these extra components for the charge. And it turns out that gravity, it looks pretty much like the same thing. The only difference is this is a vector of space time and this is a vector of say color space right but so that further motivates um you know why we might want to go to extra dimensions because we could combine space time with the, the the gauge symmetry associated with the other forces to kind of unify energy momentum and charge let's say um and it's also remarkable there's a lot of work in the literature where they're finding ways to compute solutions of gravity uh classical gravity quantum gravity from yang mills theory uh, yep, yeah, they're still trying to figure out the precise reason for all this, why all this works. And the basic point is we're all trying to figure out, um, you know, how do we make gravity look like Yang-Mills theory so we can unify it with the standard model. And so 
there's this other formulation of gravity that uses differential forms. It kind of removes some of the, the indices. So if you don't like tensors, I mean, well, <laughs> you know, it's more math to learn, but I mean, the good news is uh, you see less indices here. So that's a little bit simpler, right? Um, and you know, when I was talking about the transport, I mentioned that for curvature, you could transport around a loop and see how the vector space rotates. And that loop is associated with this dx mu wedge dx nu. It's, it's, this is like an area element associated with the loop where the curvature is located. So then this here depends on these local indices and it completely removes these global indices. So now we've kind of, we have this formulation that's completely independent of the base manifold. It's, it's uh, independent of the, the actual structure of what's going on and it's purely gauge theoretic. And then you get this, uh, so it's a two form because we're hiding two indices and um, the torsion two form leaves one gauge index here. And the non-metricity tensor is a one form, as I was saying, because you just consider transport on an open line rather than a around a closed loop that uh, you know, forms an area like you do for curvature and torsion. So that, that makes it a one form. And so you have two indices left over here associated with those two vectors that you're transporting. And then you can think of these as field strengths. So an electric field and a magnetic field are examples of field strengths in Maxwell's theory. And then there was this electromagnetic potential. You had the scalar potential and the vector potential, maybe like phi. Well, the, the scalar potential is kind of like a voltage, right? And then you had A as a vector field. Those got unified into this four vector, A mu. And that was the potential. So you have the, in Maxwell's theory, in the relativistic formulation, you have this electromagnetic potential as a, as a potential. And then you take derivatives of that, and that leads to the field strength that encodes the electric and magnetic fields. So now here we have three different potentials. We have the spin connection that leads to this curvature. We have the, the, the frame field that leads to this torsion tensor. And we have the metric tensor itself that leads to non-metricity. And I mean, let's be honest, I mean, probably 99%, even like a lot of gravitational researchers don't know this. This is pretty obscure, but this is a very nice picture because it really starts to disentangle what goes to what. Like most people just assume the metric immediately goes to curvature. And what they're failing to recognize is that, well, technically what's happening is you're, you're reducing the theory to some simplicity where you get this like cascading of coincidences where it turns out that the metric is related to the frame field, which is related to the spin connection, which then relates to the curvature tensor. And so when people don't go to this full uh, framework, they, they often get confused about what should make sense. Um, so yeah, basically there's different types of transport as I was alluding to. There's this geodesic equation that we'll call geodesic transport and that uses the levi civita connection. But there's also this notion of auto parallel transport, which uses the most general affine connection that could include the contorsion and the disformation coming from the torsion and the non-metricity. And so you can get in these philosophical debates about, well, what, you know, what is the valid transport? If I'm transporting a vector from A to B, you know, what, what, what equation do I use? There's not really even a good consensus yet on what the best way to do this. Everyone has different opinions. Um, as far as I've seen, one good opinion seems to be, like if you have torsion, you can imagine kind of uh, taking a string and like twisting it and then it'll cause you to like spiral in a helix. And so if you had a vector field and there was torsion and you ignored the torsion, then you would be on the geodesic transport, right? So imagine, let's say you have torsion, it's gonna cause some spiraling leading to a helix, let's say, and you forgot about the torsion. So you did the transport one way, you go from A to B and you get this vector and it ends up where it ends, ends up. It turns out the auto parallel transport allows you to take another path from A to B, but it's a different path. And you wouldn't twist the vector as you're transporting it. But when you end up at B, it, it, the path is chosen such that you land on something that it twists it in the way that the vector would have rotated as if you transported along the geodesic, but accounted for the torsion. <laughs> I wish I made a better picture to demonstrate that, but basically, it seems like there is some nice notion of this geodesic transport. We want to latch onto it and keep that as what's going on. But that's maybe the path that's going to be followed. But it also is helpful to consider the auto parallel transport to maybe correct for something. 
that's at least one in, in uh, one interpretation that seems sophisticated and interesting, <laughs> that seemed sensible at least. So um, I'm not even gonna mention that last comment. So yeah, basically um, you can have this Lagrangian that goes in your action principle, and then now you can have typically you have this uh, this stress tensor that I was talking about that's a derivative with respect to the metric, but now you get these other sources that you can consider because you have the the frame field. Sorry, this is that's the same thing as that EA. It's sometimes called E or theta. This E right here, we have this spin connection, this frame field, and this metric. Um, it's a similar thing here. We have this connection here, this frame field, and this metric. Those lead to different sources. And um, just something to keep in mind <laughs> if you happen to go into these theories. And so basically, um, as I was mentioning before, you have this geometrical trinity of gravity where within metric affine gravity, you can simplify again, and you can go just back to curvature you'll get general relativity, or you could just focus on torsion. Turns out there's this metric tail parallel equivalent to general relativity theory. And um, basically this just, it, it has a gauge group of the translations alone, which is interesting. And then this non-metricity theory is called symmetric tail parallel equivalent to general relativity. We got these beautiful names, these awesome acronyms. <laughs> And um, actually people refer to these as different. This is also called coincident gravity. Um, and some if you just hear teleparallelism, they're usually talking about this one now because uh, this one came later. So, so more people know about this theory. This is the most common one. Some people know about this theory and few people know about this theory. Uh, and this one is actually my favorite, <laughs> um, but fair enough. So this is the, the metric tele teleparallel theory. It's a bit of a mouthful. And um, basically it's flat, which means it has no total curvature and it's metric compatible, which means it has no non-metricity. So that's why they call it. There's actually a reason for it. The name is because, so they actually, they name the theory not based on what it has, but based on what it doesn't have, which I guess doesn't make that much sense, but fair enough. So um, that paper, they didn't even cite the original theory where it came from. So this is, it, it's, it was found in 1976. You get this Lagrangian for it. It's in terms of the torsion tensor. And um, basically the translations are the gauge group. And it, actually Feynman said that, um, you know, the translations are like the gauge group for gravity, but I don't think he understood how it was related to torsion. So, I mean, we have uh, these, you know, big figures in physics who providing us clues that some of these formulations are nice. And so as far as I'm aware, this is the, uh, the first formulation of teleparallelism that uh, is equivalent to GR at low energies. And um, basically what you can do is take the Einstein-Hilbert action in terms of the total curvature. And that total curvature is gonna contain uh, curvature from uh, torsion <laughs> actually. And then it's gonna contain the other curvature that you're more familiar with. And then when you set that to zero, you, you subtract all the torsion stuff to the other side, and then you'll, you'll see this pop out um, in case anyone is interested in deriving this. That's how you do it. And um, basically, you can do the same thing for the symmetric teleparallel equivalent to GR theory. It's once again flat. So any teleparallel theory uh, has no total curvature. And um, it's torsionless, which means that the affine connection is symmetric because the torsion tensor was this anti-symmetric uh, piece of the affine connection. So if the affine connection is symmetric, then there is no anti-symmetric part. So once again, we're naming this theory based on what it doesn't have. And it's symmetric and teleparallel, which means it, it could have non-metricity. And you do the same trick again, and you can find that you get this Lagrangian and you can, it's actually, um, that, don't worry about trying to derive the field equations. If you're interested, I'd love to talk to you more. It's, it's, a, it's a fun calculation to try to do. And basically this theory was found in 1998, but then it was rediscovered maybe three years ago. And it has this covariant energy momentum tensor instead of a pseudo tensor, which um, helps for a lot of considerations with energy conservation. So it, it's actually remarkable looking back in the history because there are a lot of people complaining about various properties about the pseudo tensor. There was this, uh, Eddington pseudo tensor and it worked nice for calculations, but it like physically didn't make sense in some regards. So this seems to fix some of those things. But you know, people were arguing about this so long ago, people don't care as much anymore. But it's good. It's good to see that that problem get fixed. And 
it allows for this coincident gauge, which is why it's, uh, I think, sometimes called coincident general relativity. And basically, the disformation becomes equal to the levy civita connection, which means that you can set the, the affine connection to vanish, and then you get the levy civita connection, and you subtract the disformation to the other side, and now you have those two terms equal. And that's just a very nice, convenient thing to look at, because um, it allows you to connect back to old theories uh, more readily, but then uh, get these nice uh, covariant properties. And so there, this is another way to write um, Einstein's, um, the Einstein-Hilbert action ends up, uh, the field, you can get Einstein's field equations from this Lagrangian. This, this Lagrangian has been known for probably almost a hundred years, but this can be recovered from this theory in a way. So that's kind of nice to see. And so then you could ask, well, okay, we have these different equivalent theories, but can we classify all of the theories that are equivalent to GR? Um, that was the question I was interested in around 2018 before that paper came out. And I was looking into this paper as well, which found that, okay, you know how I mentioned this first order versus second order formulation? The first order formulation uh, treats the connection as dynamical, whereas the second order formulation treats the metric as dynamical. So there's this uh, history of vial gravity going back to let's see, 1918. And um, at first, everyone treated it as a second order formulation just because that's the only thing they knew how to do. And so Vile had his theory of gravity and people argued about that. And most people decided it wasn't the greatest theory. But this theory from 2013 is claiming that uh, basically, if you treat Vile gravity as a first order formulation, then it leads to Einstein's field equations uh, if the torsion vanishes. And so Basically, this could be another way to get an equivalent. And, and so the, the Lagrangian is an R squared Lagrangian. So the Einstein -Hilbert, Hilbert action just had the R term. And once again, I was talking about Yang Mills theory, which has a, it has a, it's a, it's a quadratic Lagrangian. And you notice this is quadratic. It has Q times Q. This is T times T, right? So if we have the R term, we have the T squared terms, we have the Q squared terms, it makes you wonder, well, what about R squared terms? Can I get that to work? You know, if you go in the literature, you start looking, people be like, you can't do it because it doesn't work, right? But uh, that's all of those people are doing a second order formulation. So if we do first order formulation, according to this author, I haven't fully vetted it, but um, it seems promising. And in fact, there's actually, you can take any Lagrangian and there's this trick you can do called gauge fixing. And then you can, you can add stuff to the Lagrangian and reparameterize things. So there's actually like an infinite number of ways to look at the same theory in a different way, which is like even a different point from all of these theories. So, and some of these techniques have also been used to find equivalents to GR that look very different and the methods for computing solutions are completely different, but then you get the same results. So this is really mind blowing to me because, you know, if there are certain issues with certain aspects of the philosophy of GR, then we can start to explore uh, the, the different philosophical standpoints for all these other equivalents. And OK, so then we can look at something maybe a little more interesting for uh, everyone in the audience here who's trying to get to uh, you know, interesting propulsion. right? So you could look at the Alcubierre drive in general relativity, and uh, you could claim that you can get faster than light travel in a global sense. And you do this trick where you, you're basically applying metric engineering such that you can have your local speed be less than C, but you're warping space time in this exotic manner such that um, you can actually get faster than light travel. And um, it, it basically involves metric engineering, which involves, I mean, this, th this is the, the difficulty. Einstein's field equations are so difficult. You can imagine trying to find a solution and you could find some solution, plug it in the equations, confirm that's consistent, but then you have to figure out, well, what matter is needed to source this solution. And basically the metric tensor is what defines length. So if you specify uh, the equations here of how length is kind of defined in that region, then that's specifying the solution to G mu mu, which is the metric tensor. And so now you've got to figure out what energy sources that. And there's, uh, you're probably aware there's, there's problems with this. Um, people say that you need a negative energy density in order to source this. And also maybe in order to accelerate, it seems like it might violate energy conservation or some weak energy condition. Um, and so basically there was this paper that came out like a week ago or two weeks ago that I saw on Jack Serfati's email list where 
they use this metric teleparallel theory that I just showed you with the torsion. And there they say that a static observer measures positive energy of the source, while a Eulerian observer measures a negative one. So you can get into all these philosophical debates now about what is energy, right? And there's all these different perspectives, especially in general relativity. There's like Bondi energy, there's this ADM energy, that energy. There's all these different energies because um, you know, we've been trying to figure out what's going on with this global energy issue with general relativity, but some of these other theories um, that came along later seem to fix some of those problems. So when you start looking at solutions of general relativity in these new theories, it provides you a new perspective that might help you figure out, well, like what, what is the, the good energy? And so um, this, this paper claimed to fix a lot of the problems with the Alcubierre drive and had a lot of hype claiming that this would be um, a good way to look at it. And then I was just searching around the internet like 10 minutes ago before I started presenting. And once again, in conformal gravity, um, they found similar things where um, basically they don't violate the, the weak energy condition when you look at it from the conformal gravity perspective. Um, you're not required to use exotic matter. And the, this, I'm just pulling this from their abstract. I didn't even look into the paper that in much detail, but they're saying basically if conformal gravity is a correct extension of general relativity, then uh, superluminal motion via an Alcubierre drive might be a realistic solution, thus allowing faster than light interstellar stellar travel. And also there was this paper um, that came out last year that was looking into some different geometric structures and they found this uh, positive energy warp drive and um, the, there was also some people talking about solitons or sound waves and different things um, potentially being anti-gravitic. I saw on the news like a few months ago, and this, this is a completely independent work, but it's uh, similar. They're talking about solitons where basically uh, they're stationary, solitary waves that uh, exhibit particle-like behavior. And they, I guess they found that you can get these superluminal solitons and they, they actually have positive energy, even though it kind of looks like they have negative energy. So you, when you hear people claiming that they found some negative energy thing, maybe just keep in mind, maybe it's not as controversial as, as they're claiming. Maybe, maybe they're actually looking at energy improperly and it, it actually is some positive energy. And so this geometrical interpretation opens new doors to generating realistic work fields for laboratory study and potential future man interstellar travel. And so at this point, I, I don't even know what time it is exactly right now, but I figured this would be a good spot to at least pause, see how I'm doing. This could be a potential spot to conclude. Let me just see how we're doing on time. Yeah. So I'll just stop and see if we have any, any questions right now or before I just uh, kind of mini conclusion would be, you know, even though Einstein's GR might not stay in its current formulation uh, forever in the future, I do believe that we can still embrace Einstein's legacy and find a lot of fruitful value from it. And um, basically these gauge theories of gravity have better behaviors for various different reasons, whether it be quantum field theory or um, getting into these different energy considerations, which uh, seem promising for uh, warp drive and Alcubierre Al drives. So I'll just stop there for a moment and see um, if there's any questions. I, I do have like another, I don't know, 30, 50 slides that I could go on. It, it's going into different formulations of gravity more, uh, less about warp drive, I figured. Oh, well, well, David, um, yeah, it's, it's Tim. D do, you wanna, do you wanna go through those then? I think we're kind of, and again, we, we might push up against the wall on this one. If you have another 30 or 50, it's up to you. Do you wanna go to Q and A session or do you want to, uh, do you wanna keep going? Oh boy, I'm, I'm open to either, whatever. I mean, if the questions are good, no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's, you know, it, it doesn't matter too much to me. Well, you know, if, if you're up to it, I mean, if you're up for it, why don't we go to Q and a session now? Do you, do you think you might yeah. be open to coming back in the future and, and you could kind of conclude from there? Yeah. And I mean, this stuff, I mean, it's just a bunch of math and stuff like, you know, I could keep going, you know, I could show you this Lagrangian, but is that going to mean anything to anyone? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, let me, let me do this then. Yeah. And I, again, I, I cannot thank you enough. So let, let me stop your screen share right now. Sure. Um, let me see. Okay. Stop your screen share. And then I'm going to put this on gallery view and everyone please give an enormous applause to Dr. David Chester.
And David, I, I, I literally, I cannot thank you enough for coming on. The, the thing that, the thing that always amazes me about your work is it's, it's not just that, you know, the theories, it's that you can compare the theories, right? And they're, they're like, there's like, so few people in the world who were able to do that and say, look, here's what this one is doing. Here's what that one is doing. So that's why it's so exciting, you know, for, for me. Thank you. I really appreciate that feedback. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I, I had the same perspective. I mean, it just, I saw so many different gravitational theories and it just became obvious that someone needs to go in and classify them and everyone's just kind of going in one direction and then just arguing this, this is the best theory because of this. And then you start looking at all the different theories, they're all finding the same results in these different formulations. So there's some bigger picture behind the scenes.